how do we as young black women acclimate to things without giving up ourselves? Watch out for the thorns, please. Watch out for the thorns on the pink one. We were creating a space where we could be vulnerable and open. And then we had to go back to our lives. Her dear mom, I miss you really a lot, and I love you. I'm going to call you on the phone, and i like to talk to you. I try to be better than my mama because I don't want to go through that. We listen to each other, we cry to each other, and we let each other know how we really feel. We have this remarkable experience of having had 10 full years together. Wings saw who each person was. It gave the girls this sense of confidence. Happy birthday, happy birthday. <laughs> what was that chemistry? It was this whole conversation started because you didn't understand why people were hurting each other. Oh. Don't think that they know higher or no lower. They the same person you are. They got the same feelings that you had. I didn't want it to be like I was just going to the hood to film some people because I know them. So I wanted it to be like, like something that you want to tell somebody about your own life. I find it hard to believe I'm really somebody's mother and have to do it, right. but then I chose it. Hey, look at all professional. Hey, a little nurse. But I've often wondered if the most painful thing that we experience as humans is not being seen and heard. Yes, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain it, but how much are the girls expected to, to give just to be a little bit successful? And why is that type of success the only thing that's seen? That's why Wings is different, because we're not talking about success based off of what college they went to. We're talking about success based off of what kind of person they are. Like, if they look at you and say, hey, how does that make you feel? My way back to camera. How do I think, I think, I think, I think? An undertaking like this is is daunting at best, and you just don't know <laughs> about how uh, the scale of something and the scope of this is going to become whatever it becomes. And I, I look at this and I go, uh, was the plan always 10 years? Was that the initial <laughs> thought, or was that something that happened <laughs> over time that you just decided that, that that was going to be where you're going to cut this off and make it happen? Yeah, that that is the question. Would you say, Nikia? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No. It. I. I rich, at first, we thought we were going to film the young women through their high school graduations, but I would say before we even neared the high school graduations, we knew we were in for um, a more significant journey. <laughs> this is a this is an undertaking that. You initially started with a small group, and the group grew because people were so interested in this. Uh, mm -hmm. How much of that logistically for you as filmmakers, uh, did you did you feel like you were prepared for that element, or did you feel like that added a nice little wrinkle that, you know, maybe expanded upon what you originally thought this was going to be? You know, we, we made an offering to these young women and some of them, uh, the original offering, um, a small percentage decided it was what they really wanted. You know, so right. we, when we really, really were getting started, we had six young women. Yeah. And yes. it was thrilling when they wanted to bring their friends. I mean, that was wonderful. Ultimately, at, at the end of all this, it really wasn't about making the film. It was about these women and how how bold and exciting their lives have become and, and what they've done. Right. Yeah. You know, you started out incorporating, giving them the opportunity to incorporate footage for themselves and, and film them some things. And some of them took advantage of that. And then it kind of waned as, as the process went on and years went on because people have 
lives and doing other things. And, mm-hmm. and, and I'm curious from your perspective, when you were in the edit and looking at this, uh, how much of that, I know you probably wanted to incorporate a lot more than you really probably did, but how much of it did you look at as it being important that that was a part of this film or did you feel like that, uh, you know, this had to be, it had to be scaled back because you wanted to tell a different story. I, you know, something that, and Nakia, you're the one who really has pointed this out to me, especially this past year. I think we've come to realize that we were trusting um, what we'll call the intuitive feminine. Mm. And and that's not gender-based. You know, the intuitive feminine is available for everyone. <laughs> Um, but we somehow trusted that within ourselves, and, and that's what allowed us to film the way we did. And I think it's important to remember mm-hmm. that we were filming each other, um, even in the years right. that some of the young women decided to put their cameras down, we were only filming if they chose what we were filming. Ah. By It was their invitation. So in some ways, they may have put their – they may have – stop participating as cinematographers here and there, but they were still acting in the role of director. So I, you know, if I was the one who was going to be filming, I would wait for the invitation. I'm curious, Nakia, as, as the de facto narrator in this film, I mean, you, you, you're on screen mm-hmm. quite a bit narrating our journey and pushing forward. I mean, Kirsten does a lot of that off camera, but you're really the focal point on right. camera and representing these women and, and pushing the, the narrative forward. Uh, did you have any right. trepidation about that? Or did you feel like that was something that, 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 <laughs> that the touch, the, it was the touch that was needed to complete this film? Well, that's a good question. Cause when we started making the film, the film was primarily about my life reflecting on what happened in the program mm. um, throughout the years. And, and as we started to dive into the storyline, we, we found out that people weren't necessarily going to be able to step into our lives that way. Um, so even though I'm narrating now, I feel like the way we've edited the film, it it's made me more comfortable with the fact that I'm the one talking the whole time <laughs> um, and, and leading us through um, because the way we've edited it now is like, anybody can kind of see themselves being a part of our group. Mm -hmm. And my narration is literally just something that complements the story in a way, rather than being the focal point of the story. You know, something I really love to talk about documentary with documentary filmmakers about is the idea that you have going into something, right? You have this idea, you may have outlined something, you may have a focal point, you may have this direction you're going. And it's even more unique for all of you, for the both of you, because you did this over a 10 year period. I mean, probably even more than that because mm-hmm. you had to edit after that. Yeah. <laughs> so right. probably more like 12, 12 years. But, exactly. but yes, yeah, so, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so with documentaries though, oftentimes what happens is, is that, you get into it, you start filming interviews, you start film, you start capturing footage, you start to look at the footage, you start to then you get into the edit and you start to, the, narr- the narrative you thought you had at the beginning completely implodes and changes on you and goes a different direction and really defines, defines itself. It's, it's one of those weird things, like it's like a fire. You know, you might start a fire and you may think the flame's gonna go one way, but the flame decides mm-hmm. to go wherever it wants to yeah. go. Because it's, mm-hmm. it's alive. It becomes alive. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, yeah. you guys, where in the process did you feel like this was so much different than what you had originally imagined? <laughs> was it during the mm-hmm. years that you were filming or was it more toward the edit? Definitely towards the edit, I believe. Yeah. 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 You know, that your question, Joe, reminds me, Nakia, I feel like this conversation we've had about some of the decisions we had to make and what we, how much of our timeline over those 10 years we actually included in the edit. And I mean, ultimately we actually still filmed a little bit. So we actually have about 12 years 
mm-hmm. in the entire edit. But one of the, the big things that happened was we were getting a lot of feedback to begin the film where the young women are at their eighth grade graduation and then to end the film when they graduated high school. And we, we had to stay with our intuitive feminine <laughs> and realize that that was going to make things too easy for the audience. Um, I don't know, Nikki, if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, uh, there's so many films that are easy to watch, you know. <laughs> I mean, we, we're a film that is different in the sense that the way we thought about it was to not use certain things as a crutch and and to let the story be told raw and as is and, you know, with the Band-Aid off immediately, like just torn off. Um, And that's intentional because that was our experience in Wings. We didn't have anyone holding our hand. We we held each other's hands. But, you know, we were experiencing this together, raw, uncut. (laughs) Um, And so if someone is going to step into our filmmaking process and watching this film and and being a part of the audience, then it will be only right for them to experience it in that way. And I feel like it's I mean. I'm definitely a budding filmmaker, but Kirsten is definitely the more experienced, you know, the veteran filmmaker. Um, and and just learning through her process and her explaining how this world works, I feel like we've done our film such a good service by not using some of the things like Baltimore being uh Baltimore being so trendy as a crutch or, or or all of these things that happen in a black girl's life who's from the inner city. I feel like we were really able to bring everything to light without so much other stuff. We're in a time in like our human in our human history where we can't have any more children born into this world not seeing their likeness in the cinema in love and light. Mm-hmm. You know, so our young women were were more used to at growing up because remember we started with them back in 2008 and they were 10, 11, 12 years old. When they saw their image in the cinema, uh, they were seeing their likeness symbolized um, against, you know, the blighted cities and, and uh, we have to reshape this whole criterion how are people image who's getting to tell their own story and elevating BIPOC voices um, both behind and in front of the camera. And that's why I'm so grateful to have Nakia as co-director and co-producer of this film, you know, because we, it's really important for us to stand together as this film's going out in the world and say, we're standing together on this, (laughs) you know, this, this yeah. is our moment to figure out who we are together because we're all living on this planet together. We have to figure it out. Was the, was the approach to kind of look at footage but just to keep filming or did you look at footage at certain periods at certain times and kind of – and did, did, the, did the ladies ever in the program get a chance to sit down and watch some of this stuff? as it was happening uh, during the time you were filming, did you all, did you all experience that as well? Did you do like a daily screening Mm -hmm. or something to that effect? We, um, in the beginning, we watched footage together every week. And then we, we did our best to introduce editing um, to the young women that became a little more complex, um, but not because they were young women. I mean, editors, (laughs) just two editors trying to share a hard drive is, confusing um but um i just i want and (laughs) we we have trailers we started releasing little trailers back in 2008 we've been editing the whole time but nikia what i i would love for you to share because it was brilliant what you did is you scheduled and orchestrated all of these focus group screenings along the way can Mm-hmm. which really is was yeah. unique yeah yeah and, and again like me being a, a new filmmaker in this sense I'm, I was just like okay <laughs> you know I I um 
I, I come from community work and um it to me if I've been filmed before in the past as a young person. I talk about that in the film. Um, and I have no clue what those films became, you know? Um, so for me, being a, a, a woman from the same neighborhood as the girls, I just felt a sense of, like, I have to do this. Like, I have to make sure that um, that we open up a small window of of focus groups so that people from different backgrounds can watch our film and we can see if they if we're really telling the story that we're trying to tell you know and for us I feel like maybe if a person was making a film over one or two years it would be different but because we've been making this we've been together for so long our purview is is so it's so different because we love everyone in the film you know so those focus groups really changed our film life <laughs> for this film. And I would say in 2019, when we had that focus group, it was a very, very good mix of all different types of people. And that's when we found out, we got it wrong a lot of times. Well, not wrong, but it wasn't, you know, as great as we, we could have gotten. Trial, trial and but, error, as most films right. do. Yeah. But that one, it was like, People were laughing when we meant for them to laugh. You know, they were crying <laughs> throughout the whole film. They were crying with me. Then we were just like, yes, we did it. We made, we're making a film that people can step into and see and not be like, who's the character again? Like, <laughs> you know, what are you guys talking about? Because before people were like, what is this bubble you have? <laughs> <laughs> but now, now you get it. Like you can, you can understand, like, this is something that, we're not crazy. It's not a cult. It's just a, a group of women loving on each other and, and making a film about it. <laughs> I, I'm curious, though, with the focus groups and, you know, editing while you're going, how much did you evolve through that process? What, how do you feel like mm -hmm. as a filmmaker you grew and, and, and do you feel like because you had so much time and so much editing prowess do you feel like at the end of it it was a lot easier toward the end because you were gaining that experience and understanding about filmmaking in the process i well a big lesson for me with the focus groups well one there was a fear that nakia had to deal with with me because i'm so used to well you can't apply to film festivals if too many you know it's like you don't have a focus group to get out of hand <laughs> <laughs> and a hundred people show up and then you've disqualified yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So I was kind of working through <laughs> all that, but you know, I, I don't even know that those rules, how they're going to be post the pandemic. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, for me, the biggest thing um, about the focus groups is we realized that folks were expressing not only concern, but anger and sadness over how um, folks living in Baltimore have been represented in film. And so these focus groups were our way of ensuring that we were going to tell the story that Baltimoreans would like to see about their own city, you know? Yes. So that, that was the huge lesson for me out of the focus groups. So, And that was such a breakthrough for us because especially for me being a young person like the girls and being filmed and not seeing this kind of thing happen for, for myself or my friends that were filmed. Um, just having that experience, being someone who's kind of just been marginalized by this whole filmmaking world, knowing that these girls don't have to experience that, you know, and as a filmmaker for me, it's just, um, it's just been powerful to know that this is something that can take place and that filmmaking doesn't have to be something that's so mysterious. Um, if you're an inner city person with a, you know, a, a hard life and someone wants to come and video your, your, your texture, <laughs> you know, um, I, I definitely know that I've evolved I mean, I'm a filmmaker now. Before in the program, I was a mentor, right? And I used to play around with film. Um, but now I can I can sit and say that I, I'm really helping to shape um, how people view 
Baltimore girls' lives, and and that's an honor and also terrifying. But it it's a great privilege to to be able to even show in something like slam dance. What what do you feel like is is the strongest thing that you gained from as a creator for this? For me, it was it's it's the idea of of collaboration, mm-hmm. um, and and it being authentic and coming from a place of um, it's okay to not know something. Yeah, and and that goes on both sides. Like, um, yes, I'm the black woman helping to make this film, and I've had to explain. Everything from us being brought here to America to <laughs> what the systematic structure feels like, and and that's fine. And and on the other end, I've had to learn a lot about everything that it takes to put a film together. And I think that Kirsten is like a a mother, aunt, sister. I don't know. We all don't know what we all are to each other. This is just like we just know that we're together and we love each other immensely. Uh, but putting titles on it feels weird. So, but because Kirsten is such a huge figure in my life, I think that the collaboration for me was for she and I is like obvious. We've already been collaborating, putting this program in order on Thursdays. I used to, you know, help and do what I could. But it was like a no-brainer for us. But I, I do understand that it's not like that for everyone. Like filmmaking with someone who isn't of your makeup can be difficult. And I think we've really mastered understanding and hearing each other. Not necessarily <laughs> always agreeing with everything, but there's a point where sometimes there's no need to be right or wrong. And I think mm-hmm. in our collaboration, we've we're a clear example of two women that just made it work. We had created a six hour rough cut that we passed off to our editor, Trina Rodriguez, which was really, mm-hmm. really important because she brought her fresh eyes and she didn't, she didn't know us, you know, but the reason I'm sharing that is because there's a, there's a shot that I insisted Trina keep. Um, Cause we weren't quite sure why I wanted it there, but it's just this little moment in the beginning of the film where I put headphones on and I realized later why I fought for that image to stay was because it was just a, a subtle moment, you know, a, a call out to my fellow white women <laughs> that um, it's time to listen and we need to listen um, to our sisters, you know, and Sometimes when you need to listen at that capacity, you might have to step out of some of your own connection to maybe some of your own hurts or traumas in your life. And and you just, you have to, it's not you're putting yourself aside, but you're just making the commitment. Am I listening or, and can I listen deeper? Yeah. When we're listening, when we're really listening to each other, there, there is no right or wrong because we've entered that place of dialectics, like Nikki is saying, you know, where we we're able to hear each other. You know, this is the part that's not so easy to talk about because what's interesting about our film is you kind of just see us all be bopping along and we're not really addressing race. It doesn't really come up. We don't really talk about it in the classroom till we've been filming for a couple of years. And I don't know if that's, I don't know why, but again, I think um, we, you really don't even, you really don't even address gender at all. You know, you have a transgender person in, in the process and, and it was just kind of, it was just kind of part of you guys growing all together. It was very, it was very fascinating. Yeah. And, and this is very tricky territory because there's, there's a place where people connect very organically. Um, and again, I really think it all goes back to just put placing one's trust in the intuitive feminine, but we also are really cautious and really clear that we, um, in our process, we, we weren't bypassing the inequities you know, that we're in the classroom. 
in our space together. And, and that's why it was so important to include the argument at our um, retreat event, because we needed to show that no matter how much we loved each other, those things still exist and in, in, yeah. existed in our space because they're there systemically, you know, right. just like the coronavirus is out there right now. These things are, have the same systemic function. Um, yeah. And so it, I think one of the most beautiful moments is when our editor, Trina, she put apart, you know, there were many things she changed in that six hour rough cut. And there were certainly things she brought in that we hadn't had the vision to put in our six hour rough cut. Sure. And one of those things was um, where Danisha, we're at a potluck at Nakia's apartment. <laughs> And mm -hmm. uh, Danisha says she's doing a project, uh, a photography project, putting people next to a food that was, uh, is close to their skin color. And when I ask her <laughs> what um, food object she's going to put me next to, she says the hot dog bun. And she <laughs> put the inside of the hot dog bun. <laughs> and I say toasted or untoasted. <laughs> and she's like, untoasted. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think that that was part of our editor's brilliance. You know, it, can we find a new way to talk about race amongst a group that is so close and has created this family? You know, can we ta find a way to talk about gender? What are the new ways we might do that when there's a close knit group? And that just brings me back to saying, you know, our dream, uh, thinking about our dream is we really hope that people we'll walk away from this film knowing um, there's a difference between committing to being an ally and there's a difference to committing to actually rolling up your sleeves and collaborating. But we also, this film imbues a mentorship model that where the dream is let's have <clears throat> 10 groups with 10 young women instead of one group with 50 young women. You know, that's part of what our film is showing and, and why we're even here right. having this conversation right now. Yeah. 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 It's a, great it's a call, to, call to action. <laughs> yeah. In the exit interviews, you all get, you get a chance to ask all the young women what they got out of Wings. What did they, what was Wings, how, how, how did that change their lives? I'm curious, you both didn't answer that question. So, I'd like you to answer it right now, if you don't mind. What did you get from Wings? What did it do to your life? How did it change your life? Mm -hmm. I don't even think we have enough time for that. <laughs> 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 I'm not too much older than the girls. I, I, I guess that should just come out. I look young, but I'm kind of old, but I'm not that much older than them. Um, so for me, being in Wings was an experience as well as, you know, it was experience for the girls. It was completely different. I I do cry a lot. And, and the thing is, like, we'll just have bloopers of me crying because I cry a lot in the whole 10, 12 years. And I'm still crying. But I think that it was a cleansing experience being a part of the program and um, just being vulnerable, learning that that skill to cry and I'm still learning it. I wish we still had those Thursdays because I, I, I need them even more now that I'm in my 30s than I did before. Uh, but I feel like I, I myself know that I one thing I took away is the ability to know that I can cry and that that is an important emotion and that I can take that and and share a little bit of vulnerability with someone else. If they're crying, I can be there with them. If I see that they might need some space to experience some emotion, then I can give them that space um, to do it or not to. Yeah, again, I it would take <clears throat> it would take a long time to say everything I gained. I mean, I definitely gained a, ex an extended family. You know, and uh, that's not, not anything I thought was possible. I had gone to college here um, in, in Baltimore City in the late 80s and was, you know, in the college bubble, I think, that a lot of us experience in higher education. And um, when my husband and son and I moved back to Baltimore City 20 years later, I just, I 
didn't want to live here again and not know my neighbors. So that was the, the original intention, but now I've gained a family. And I also, uh, you know, I feel like, and I'm in a slightly different life position, life place in Nakia because I'm 55 years old and <laughs> just looking at what does that mean? Like I've already lived, you know, half my life. Um, so what that means for me partially is as a girl, um, I was very um, intuitive and I grew up in a society that didn't really appreciate that in girls, you know, and uh, this film was such a blessing to see that girls and women together could come together and even people on the continuum of gender or, or non-gender like I was saying, the, the um, intuitive feminine is for everyone. So I just feel so incredibly blessed to be able to talk about that publicly <laughs> and to say that that, you know, allowed um, the vulnerability that Nikki is describing to be alive in our project. What do you love about being indie filmmakers? What is it that, that drives you with this? What is it? What mm. is, what, why do you love it? It, you know, I, I'd like to actually quote Slam Dance um, because they have this beautiful logo with the green, the match with the green light this year. And they talk so much about green lighting yourself, you know, and mm -hmm. boy, that's what we want to see in this, in our culture. That would take care of even a lot of the systemic <laughs> things we've been talking right. about is if yeah. everyone knew in their heart, they could green light their own self for their own cre creativity for who they are. Imagine the world, what the world would be like, you know. There's so much power in being a, a indie filmmaker too that I'm learning. So, if you were given some of the footage, not not ten years worth, but <laughs> some of the footage that you saw, and you had never experienced this before, but you were being told that you could experience this by seeing some of this footage. Would you say you would go through this entire process all over again? Of making the film or being in way? <laughs> uh, well, either way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. More, more like making the film, but yeah. They're kind of, kind of inseparable. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love being in wings, making a film, Film makers are crazy people. I love Kirsten. She's not crazy. But I, this is like it's like it's never ending. I don't understand. And 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 professionally I'm a graphic designer, so I'm not far from the art world ish. Yeah. It's just that this is like if you have to edit a logo twelve thousand times and it's still not done. It's just like <laughs> when is this over? Um so for me in my mind. I would do wings a thousand times. Would I make this film again? Yes. And also part of me is like, I don't think there's enough time in my life. I appreciate you being honest. I would love to make a film again. It's just this is Not this is a years. feat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've I've promised know. I've promised my husband that my next project will take them <laughs> two years. Because, yeah, I have a history of really long <laughs> projects. Um, but, um, yeah. <laughs>